Hello, everybody. Um, as some of you may have heard, <laughs> I was barely able to get here because of a horrendous accident on 101, which is once a semester, these things seem to have to always happen. It looked like a serious injury accident. Uh, a higher patrol had th three of the four lanes blocked uh, right around where the Petaluma Sloth is. And uh, it just dead stop. <laughs> And then very slow, not gallery view. Oh, I didn't realize I'd done gallery view. I didn't mean to, but that's okay. Speaker view, because I have something to show you guys that'll be very helpful to you. Um, now what's it doing? Huh. Things have been malfunctioning as well today, but here we go, that should work. Hmm. Hey, there we go. Okay, I have a couple things to show you. And the thing is that I didn't use the whole classes on the day before Thanksgiving, when it was all in person, because I knew, you know, for people to travel, I mean, that's an example of what happened today on 101, both directions. It was, I don't know what happened on the southbound direction, the northbound direction was, and then there was a second smaller accident in Santa Rosa too on 101. So fun times, um, but I got here barely in time. So if you guys are wondering why I didn't try to send you the log on by 2.45, that's why I just got to my office at 2.53. <laughs> But I have some helpful information here that I should have held up before. So I'm going to keep this on the screen for, oh, you know, let's say a couple of minutes so you can, or else it can just be, you know, when you watch the video for review. These are the five main movements of early modern architecture. Now, we have covered uh, four of them in the previous lectures. Remember, this is a two-week at least, and probably won't finish up until on Monday with the final must knows from this topic, our last new topic before the final. So these terms I have defined um, pretty well, except for number four. And we skipped over that slide unintentionally. I forgot that I had put it, in, it back in the earlier file that was meant for last week. So we're gonna start with that. And then we're gonna do one more slide from that same, you know, movement or style. So two from what would have been last week's lecture and then proceed with the latter half of early modern architecture as per the syllabus, which we were getting partway through on Monday. So all of this, of course, is gonna be on the videos. I'll post them before Saturday or by Saturday at noon. I've been saying Friday, but that, that tends to be very difficult to get them all done. Plus, it's the holiday weekend, as you all hopefully will relax uh, <clears throat> at least part of the, the weekend. So, in other words, if, if you missed any of the previous three lectures on this subject, you will definitely want this is an important announcement in case anybody's here now who wasn't here on, uh, you know, um, a week ago, Monday, or whenever it was, I said, I think it was then that on the final, I can guarantee you there will be at least two slides of architecture, uh, one in the slide analysis and one in the slide identification section. Plus this set of terms could appear, that's why I'm holding it up now, on the true false section, which is how the definitions get tested. And of course, those are statements where if any one part or one fact in that sentence is incorrect, the whole thing is false. It's the same exactly uh, procedure as the midterm was. And of course, you know, the final is not cumulative, right? And counts with the same number of points, 100 plus the extra. Okay, so I'm gonna put this down now. Let's admit this. Hey, Mark, a quick question. Sure, any questions, now's a good time. Sure, um, on the Bay Movement, why the, um, how did it get its name? Oh, a tradition. Sorry, that, that's first a, Bay tradition. Excellent question, and I can answer quickly. I wrote my master's thesis with the man that coined that term. He won the um, Pulitzer Prize. Pretty honored by that. He was my thesis advisor and mentor, Alan Temko. He's the first um, historian of any kind to write an article, uh, a national magazine article about Julia Morgan. But he did it because of the protest when Life Magazine, I think I mentioned this fact, ran a whole feature long article on Hearst Castle, not more than a year after she died or maybe, didn't even mention her name. <laughs> it's like, how can much more insulting can you get than, you know, the whole thing was, you know, that creation she brought into being, right? 
with the money, of course, provided by Hearst. So he wrote this piece and was angry about that. And then he decided to become a teacher. He taught at Cal State, uh, it's now East Bay, it was Hayward, where I got my master's and he was my thesis advisor. So he coined that term, I believe a few years later, around 1960, for one of the national magazines. He was very well known as an architectural historian. And his name was Alan Temko. And if for extra credit, you might want to look up some of his articles. He wrote the, uh, all the architecture articles for the San Francisco Chronicle. That's what get, get, got him the Pulitzer Prize, say that last five times, in around, I don't know, 90 something, 95, maybe it was. And uh, I got to interview him. I'm the, I beat all my competitors too. I had a newspaper column then in the East Bay papers. Uh, and so I got to interview him. He was a neighbor in my neighborhood, North Berkeley. And he was still teaching at Cal State Hayward. Now he passed away a few years ago. Yeah, Alan Temko coined that phrase and it caught on because it, it, it's a very good phrase to describe what's different about, the, you know, unique about Bay Area environmentally sense of design as mm -hmm. opposed to the Frank Lloyd Wright version, which is exactly the same concept. But as you know, now, if you watch the last two lectures, a very different type of environment design, environmentally sensitive design, sorry. And that's because prairie style, well, the name it's there also is self-descriptive. It has to do with the environment in the Midwest, which is mostly flat prairie. So the two have the same concept underlying them, those two movements, and they're almost simultaneous. So in any honest assessment of this period that we're covering, I would say equal credit should go to both Bernard Maybeck and Frank Lloyd Wright for innovations that are still with us today. In other words, you could call them not the only, but two of the founding fathers of green design. That phrase didn't exist when they were around, of course. But that I don't know who came up with that phrase. But that's that's late 20th century, I think. Okay, that answers your question, I hope. Yeah. So, but you could find a documentary. Oh, there's one on Julia Morgan. It's terrible. It's so boring. It's all talking. It has my my mentor, Alan Temko, talks, and his parts actually not not quite so boring. But don't talk about architecture with just having people talking, just like I'm doing now in front of a camera back then. There was no Zoom uh, for you know, 10 minutes about a building. Go to the building, go through the building, film people in the building, show events held there the way that the original architecture was intended. Because every one of Julia Morgan's public buildings, with few exceptions, is still serving the purpose she designed them for just as well today. They opened 100 or more years ago. To me, that's a testament of a great architect. So, all right, any other questions relating to um, history, or, uh, you know, not history, I meant art, this topic of, of course, early modern architecture or uh, to your grades. Um, I do have now finally, but it was around midnight and I didn't have, I was just, you know, I had to get up early to drive up here from Berkeley. If I'd known how bad the traffic was, I had to get up an hour earlier than usual. But anyway, I just didn't have the energy to log the grades in. And as you can see, I wouldn't have had time today. So I will over the next, not tomorrow, <laughs> over the weekend, let's say by Saturday, and probably Friday. I'll just say, well, I think if I do that, and then the, the videos will be posted by Saturday morning by around uh, noon or so of the previous three, well, this, this week's lectures. So in other words, if you didn't get your grade and you turned your second paper in on time, you, you'll get it uh, certainly by the end of the day, Friday. So you can check you know, anytime late Friday evening or, or over the weekend. Okay, I've sent grades to some people, those that I graded or have already gotten back. Okay, any other questions? Extra credit, uh, nobody's done better than, I think one person has 40 points, but almost everyone else, no one's got 60, the maximum. But keep that in mind, that's a nice sort of cushion. That's equal. Plus it's an interesting way to learn about something where you're not being graded, you automatically get X points for just doing a certain task. Yeah, Julia Morgan, A Life, I think. It's a PBS documentary. It's probably, I don't think it'd be available on Netflix or, or Amazon. I'm not sure. It was PBS. It, it might be. I, I mean, I, I admire her work, as you can tell. One of my heroines, but they just didn't bring her, her legacy to life. It was just one of those plotting, you know what I mean? So it might be hard to watch all the way through. But of course, you don't have to necessarily to write two pages. You could watch the parts where they actually did go to Hearst Castle, and that part was well done, where they walk through the buildings and talk about her concepts and the design of that remarkable world famous site. But they didn't get to some of the best buildings she did here in the Bay Area, the first Bay Tradition ones. Okay, any other questions about grades? 
papers, extra credit. All right, let's get started then. All right, uh, so let's assume, I hope that this is going to be full screen when I pull it up and just make sure, can everybody see this? Yes? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, good. Yeah. It's helpful to hear that, yeah. All right, so here we go. It's actually back um, on, um, no, it is, it's on this week's list. Yeah, there we go. It is, it's the first one we skipped over. Okay, but this is really important. I'm not gonna cut this from the study list. Okay, there's your tip, you know, your heads up or whatever you wanna call it uh, for you to take. You know, of course, it's, I'm sure you all do anyway, thorough notes, but also make sure you study them carefully. When we do the final review, uh, I will cut the list as I always do by about 40% but this will not be cut from the study list for the file. Okay, the architect's name was Gropius, G-R-O-P-I-U-S. And this is the, the name of this building, Bauhaus Shop Block. Now I'll spell course, that's a German word. Well, you see it right there on the building, right? B-A-U-H-A-U-S. It's German for to build a house. That's what it literally means, but it's a, a phrase. So it's, it's a one word in the syllabus, the way it's spelled there. And, and in, in German too, as far as I know, shop block is also one word. Could be two, but I've always seen it printed as one. So again, I'll repeat that. The title is Bauhaus Shop Block, 1926. Well, even if you don't know much about architecture and all you're ever gonna you know, want to know is what you have to learn for the final in this class, even if that is the case, I understand. Architecture is a very specialized area for most people. It's not as much of an interest as painting and sculpture. I totally understand that. But even if that's the case with anyone listening now, um, take a look at this building and think, this is nearly a hundred years ago. This building was so radically ahead of its time that in a way I'll make a comparison I don't think I've ever done in any of my classes for 25 years of teaching architecture and art history at the JC. This was as far ahead of its time or as radical, you can put it this way in your notes if you want, radical departure from previous um, public building design. This is not a residence, of course. As Frank Lloyd Wright's Roby House was, as far ahead as his house, that Roby house uh, as the first modern house, remember we covered that last week, was for, for residential design. I'll say it again. This building was as far ahead of its time for public building design as Frank Lloyd Wright's Roby house was for residential design. Both started trends around the world were still influenced by, is the point. These were seminal works of art. The Roby House, no question. This building, no question. It's not there anymore. I'm not sure what's on the site. It uh, got bombed during World War II. But Hitler had already closed. You could write this if you want, as far as me. He hated the, this style. And he closed that uh, school. And any unfortunate professors who either had been critical of him <laughs> in their classrooms or were Jewish, if they hadn't left, and most of them, the Jewish ones got, got a, a warning. I don't know how it happened, but they knew it was gonna come and arrest them. So they got out, many of them, and came to the US or, or England or somewhere else. Uh, but those that stayed, um, the ones that he didn't like, or just because they were Jewish, they were rounded up and sent to concentration camps. So he closed this school of architecture even after it had become world famous because it had been around for about 20 years by the time he did that. So this was their shop block. I think that word self-explanatory, right? I mean, not exactly though. So I should say, what was the purpose? Well, it's where the uh, design classes were in um, you know, beginning design where students, architecture students now, of course. The school, by the way, taught everything, not all the visual arts, not just architecture, but it was most famous for architecture and this style that was created by one of the professors and you see his name in your syllabus. Walter was his first name, Gropius. He's one that got out along with Mies van der Rohe. We covered him, remember, with Seagram building in our last lecture. Uh, those two were both high ranking instructors, you know, highly respected near the top of their fields in Germany during the 20s and early 30s. And then they had to leave sometime before World War II. Um, <clears throat> of course, <laughs> to save them their lives and they came, both of them came to the United States. Um, so this building, when it was designed was where students would build models, you know, architectural models 
and study actual, you know, hands-on design techniques. Uh, so that's why they call it the shop block. Things were made here, you know, in their, you know, machine shop somewhere, but there were also classrooms and professors' offices. So it was a multi-purpose academic building for the architecture department of the Bauhaus, which was the name of the college itself, as well as the style. Now that's the other part of the meaning is, well, how do you recognize this style as opposed to any other modern style or early modern style? Well, it's pretty much glass walls with metal framing and no ornament, an absence of ornament, unless you want to count the letters, which I don't even know if they're original to the building. This, this photo must have been taken right before World War II. My guess is maybe as late as 1940 because you know Germany wasn't being bombed till after, right? that year so somehow the building survived into the 40s and then was destroyed during the war <clears throat> so this this photo may or may not i mean the detail of the name on the side of the building it, the letters look to me original i've never seen another photo besides this one that shows this end of the building they're always dead on straight or from this angle so i don't know but let's assume the lettering is original if you want to call that ornament you could but it really isn't it just defines the, the purpose of the building so there's no ornament in uh, the uh, Bauhaus style. And remember the other term for that, and it's in that piece of uh, handwritten notes I held up is the fourth of the five elements that you need to remember for the exam of early modern architecture. The other term, it's synonymous for it. A Bauhaus is international style. We did cover that with the uh, skyscraper version of that. And that would be the Seagram building which was designed by one American member, Philip Johnson, and one of these professors, who of course was an architect, practicing architect. Uh, and that would be Mies van der Rohe. But Gropius created this. Uh, they used to debate or who got credit, you know, with this, it's kind of pointless, but this building is by Gropius and it's the first building with that style on that campus. And therefore it started this whole movement of glass and steel boxes, for everything from, you know, four, three or four story buildings like this, classrooms, offices, whatever, all the way up to multi-story skyscrapers. And of course, we still see that style as the dominant style in urban centers, uh, you know, in, in cities uh, all around the world. It's not the only style being used, but it, it's, it dominates the skylines of cities ever since about 1945, when it was imported to the US first outside of Germany. Uh, Hitler never had a glass and steel skyscraper. He could have had them built if he liked this style in Berlin or somewhere else in Germany, but they, they didn't do that until after the war, of course. So the style became an international style and that's what we call the international school or style or Bauhaus, either term is acceptable. Okay, there isn't much more to describe about it except to say that uh, after this um, building was created, uh, well, just one more fact, then we'll do a formal analysis. Uh, it was illustrated just like the Roby House in Chicago. That's how it became famous. Of course, you, there were there were newsreels, but I don't think that's how most people saw this. The images of this building, they would have seen them in the magazines, uh, maybe newspapers. Yeah, they, that's right. There were photographs in newspapers by this time, by the twenties. Newspapers, magazines, and maybe even occasionally a few books, which would have illustrated this style as the newest trend from Europe uh, and or therefore, you know, the cutting edge, right? Or as my aunt in Indiana would call it, avant-garde of the French ranks, avant-garde. Um, it caught on first in Europe before it caught on here, but not for skyscrapers. There were, and you're going to see proof of that in the very next slide, uh, French versions of Bauhaus after the Germans, the next country to adopt it. Well, next door, you know, I've seen a map of Europe, right? Next door to Germany is France. So the French adopted, then the Dutch, and then the English. And eventually we, we adopted it after World War II because of the two architects who helped create it. Both Gropius and, and Mies van der Rohe had it, some hand in it, but there's no debate. The first building of that style was this one. And this was only Gropius. He didn't have a partner in this design. Okay, let's do the formal elements. It's pretty obviously neutral colors, right? Except for the door. 
And I'm not sure, again, if that's the original color of this door. I don't think it is, but it, it might be. But obviously it's overwhelmingly, uh, you could say cool because the gray kind of evokes that, but this is black. It may not look black in this photo because the photo is extra highly lit. But I've, I've seen sharp, actually video of this. The, the real films were made here in Germany, mostly, with this building as part of the background. So I've seen plenty of images of it. So this, these are actually black painted metal things. So black, transparent, and you could say light gray. Remember, shades of black, white, and shades of gray combined is all neutral, right? We covered that with the first week of class when I showed you one of Picasso's paintings with those colors. So there's no, it's not considered cool here, unless you want to get technical and say, well, around the door, that's warm. So on either side of it, that those two colors could be considered cool, but really just keep it simple. In the lettering is, is part of that. So these are just various neutral shades of black, white, and gray. Then we have the rhythm, of course, of the uh, walls of glass and the metal framing and the windows on the ground floor and the, the side of the building. And of course the lettering, it's entirely stable. I don't see anything dynamic about it. Again, unless you count a couple of the letters, but that's, it's not part of the building. So there's no curved lines. It's a single mass, you can't really break it down. But in terms of space, it is a four story building with long hallways uh, on each floor filled with various size classrooms and offices, just say it that way. So there are various sizes of classrooms and offices on each floor. There's a long hall, I've seen, I've seen photos of the interior. Um, and so four stories, of course. This actually may look like it's just the basement, but it's actually a story because the ceiling is, goes up to the site here. So I think that they're about equal <clears throat> height, the, the ceilings in each of the four floors. Okay, then we have um, line here. It's all visual, of course, the framing around the glass uh, in the windows and on the walls themselves. And at the corners is, of course, visual line. Textures are all real. Real smooth glass, real smooth metal, and real smooth concrete. This concrete is painted and maybe even sanded, but it is smooth. I've seen, again, close-up photos of it. So they're all smooth, real textures. The modeling is just the shadows from the sun. And in this one, their only modeling is underneath the overhang and the doorway. So there's no technique for modeling. And it's balanced, it's symmetrical. If you were to stand in front of it, there's another entrance at this side here, of this height. So it's symmetrical left to right, and of course, balanced top to bottom. Okay, let's move on. I took this off the list so you guys get a break I didn't intend to do, and that's because my frazzled brain was not functioning fully near the end of the lecture I gave, uh, I think it was Monday. Uh, it was just too much on my mind. So um, you don't have to write these notes, but I'm gonna go ahead and give you, we won't do the formal analysis since it's not gonna be on the test, but that's because some of you probably right now who are here now, we're not in the class, the Zoom class on uh, Monday. So you can cross off the second one, but I'm gonna tell you the, the, the information about it because it's an important building. And it did set a trend in my mind for the worst, but that's a matter of opinion, but it's a very important building. However, I already promised to cut it. So I'm not gonna go back on my promise. So, all right, now, if you didn't already take your pen and cross off the second building down, but I'll go ahead and tell you the name of it for those who might wanna know more about it, but you don't have to write this unless you want to. Le Corbusier, the architect. L-E and then second half of the name C-O-R-B-U-S-I-E-R. -E that was his uh, nickname. Uh, and then the title, the name of this, it's a house, if it was not, it's Villa Savoy, S-A-V-O-Y-E, 1930. Okay, again, the point about this is it's another seminal work of art. Why? Because it started a trend with residential architecture and the Bauhaus is the influence for this. If you look at the building, one critic called it a Bauhaus residence on stilts. <laughs> well, that kind of makes sense. 
because here's the garage and probably a workshop and laundry or whatever the service area they call that. Uh, and here's the living area. And upstairs, let's go up closer. Uh, you have this um, open free flowing floor plan, which Wright had already pioneered. So there's some influence of Wright in that there are two things that show Wright's influence. Again, you won't have to know this specific information for this slide, so it's not to be on time. But here we have the uh, utility core. We covered that with the Roby House. And then the first house to ever do that was that house by Frank Lloyd Wright in Chicago 20 some years earlier, right? Actually, the Roby House is 1906. It says 1909 in syllabus because that year it was completed and that's what Stocksville has. But it was designed and made popular and famous by drawings, photos of it all over the world in 1906. I don't know why it took three years to complete, but it did. So that concept was almost a quarter of a century old by the time this house was built. So this man was called by some people, it was nicknamed Le Corbusier, the Frank Lloyd Wright of France. And that's not too far off, except that I would say that Wright's work had a little more warmth and certainly variety of a texture, material, color. This has not. It's painted white concrete and black, painted metal and glass windows. We're not doing the formal house. I'm just saying that's what defines this as a kind of a very limited version or you could say short version of the Bauhaus. Um, most Bauhaus buildings are public buildings uh, by definition, and they're they're going therefore going to be you know at least two stories and usually four or more. So here we have just really a one story house, but it's on race. They, you know this this qualifies of course as the first floor. So you can say it's a two story building, yes, but it isn't as big as, as any public Bauhaus style or national style building. But it clearly shows the influence of that movement, which was just across the border, right in uh, Germany what, four years earlier. So Le Corbusier was highly influenced by both Wright and the Bauhaus School of Design. He called this, this is the last couple of facts, I'll say we'll move on with no formal analysis. He, that is, this architect, Le Corbusier, called this house, it was his first house in that mode, a kind of a quasi Bauhaus style or international style residential design. He called this style and this house, a machine for living. Oh, well, I don't know about other people, but I don't like the idea of being a cog in a machine as, where, as part of where I live for, for my home and family life. I'd rather not live in a machine. It caught on with some people. It definitely influenced a lot of the more, you know, whatever, avant-garde, there we go, that's what word is so useful, you know, cutting edge home builders and designers around the world, particularly in Europe and, and North America. You see houses like this in the hills of uh, the Bay Area and, and Los Angeles too, and, and um, in many parts of Western Europe, but it, it wasn't popular enough to become a mass movement the way writes the Prairie and uh, Usonian styles did, because those led to early modern houses that we still see being created with the same concepts behind them. So this was had some limited appeal to the point, but, but it still was influential, no question for, and still is, you still see homes like this being built as we speak. There's one right now in Berkeley Hills, not far above where I live. And someone chose to probably look at some old photos of uh, the Kobe says work. I think I said this on Monday, but in case you weren't here, there's a movie, you get actually credit for this if you want to and write two pages about it called, um, Fahrenheit 451, by the way, that's a temperature paper burns at. It's a Ray Bradbury, oh, it's hard to say what was it. He was the best science fiction writer in my mind of the 20th century, and many others would agree. And it's a French director, but the film is in English, made with an international cast, supposedly in the future, like 21 something. The film was 1970 or so, predicting a bleak future where everybody lived in high rises designed by Le Corbusier and they're there, they are real. They didn't create sets or do, there was no CGI, of course, in 70. It's a bleak concept of having to live inside machines and become yourself a cog in a giant machine. That's the point of the, the novel by Ray Burby and the movie version of it. And I'm pretty sure you could find that on both either Netflix or Amazon. Um, again, the title is Fahrenheit 451. There might have been another version of it, the film version I'm thinking of is the one with Oscar Werner as the title character and Julie Christie, that was it, as his wife. And oh boy, is it sad to watch the two of them go through 
you know, the motions of being alive in that movie. It's, it's, it's a powerful film. And he chose the Hus Lacrobius says, the, he called him dehumanizing, the director, Francois Truffaut, who is often called the, you can't call him the Hitchcock because he didn't do horror films, just the most famous French director of his generation. And he chose those buildings of this architect's work because he thought they were inhuman, not inhuman, um, dehumanizing, that was his word. It's a matter of opinion, but I would agree with him. Okay, we now have to switch. It'll take me about 60 to 90 seconds to get um, <clears throat> to the, no, hang on here. So I have to go down below. Now, why are we, where are we going here? Oh, I know what I have to do. Yeah, sorry, I have to switch files here. Hmm, no, I'm not seeing where to get there. Ah, there we go, I just had to hit it hard. Okay, we're going to just switch to the next file for the remaining slides of this topic. Okay, these are in documents. It doesn't want to, there we go. Okay, yeah, I love how things disappear when you... <laughs> now, we're going to do 20th century architecture. It's a... Okay, <laughs> some of you have dealt, probably dealt with this. Uh, <clears throat> I may have to ask my assistant. Oh, hang on, the computer's malfunctioning. <laughs> I can't get this file. Why is it doing that? Okay. Well, I'm not sure what to do about this. It's the first time I've had this happen while I'm in the middle of the lecture. Hang on, we'll figure out a solution, but I think what's gonna happen is... Oh. Anybody have any advice? I'll admit to you that I'm, I'm stumped. I don't know why it won't let me access my own files here. Let's For the screen share? Yeah, yeah, I'm trying to get to Mark's pictures. Well, give, give me another two minutes. If we can't do this within three minutes or so, I may have to just, okay, why is it not letting me? Look, it disappears. How am I supposed to access the files? Elena, I could use your help. There's something wrong here. Every time I try to access my files, they disappear. Look, <laughs> I've never seen it do that. I need to get the 20th century architecture. I need to get that. On there. Sorry, my trusty assistant. Yes, well, what did you do differently? I did the same thing. Why did it not? Sorry, you guys. I apologize. You're seeing sausage being made, as they say in politics. <laughs> yes, uh, no, the whole list. I need the entire list. Yeah. Yeah. But why did it disappear when I dragged the thing over there? It should be in there. Yeah. Okay, pictures. I can do it from there. Yeah, thank you. Okay, there we go. My trusty assistant is, in case you didn't know, my daughter. <laughs> Obviously, someone born in the 21st century is going to be more tech savvy. Than us. Okay, there we go. I apologize for the delay. All right, that wasn't too bad. It's probably mildly amusing, right? <laughs> okay, here we go. Oh, but these are some really interesting slides, so I think you'll find that it's worth your time. Oh, yeah, then I have to do this to get to the screen share and that won't take long. That's just um, as long as I don't. Okay, share screen. There we go, we're on our way now. Come on. All right, so I'll go ahead and give you the title of this while I get it ready. This is on your list, it's a must know. Um, hmm. Did I cut it? Oh, yeah, I've been trying to be, you know, extra efficient yeah yeah i, did I don't see it. that on the list yeah you, you can tell what it is i'll go ahead and tell you and you, you can get a break from taking notes <laughs> uh then okay but first i want to make sure everybody can see it yeah well you could because you just said yeah no this is kenzo tange one of my favorite architects t-a-n-g-e in a case it's not obvious from the spelling of his name he was japanese he did pass away not too long ago but he had a long career so he was a post-World War II Japanese architect who created very innovative public buildings. And he was in the vein of, let's go back to the last slide we covered before we ended, right, on Monday. In a similar vein as um, 
other architects such as uh, this one, of course, um, is the um, TWA terminal by Sarin. And we covered that on Monday, that is still on the must know list. Uh, so they both were biomorphic. That's the word I'll spell that in case you've never used it before or you weren't with us on Monday. Biomorphic, one word, pretty phonetic, B-I-O-M-O-R-P-H-I-C. Biomorphic means having to do with living things. So with a biomorphic building, the building should evoke a living creature. Well, we know this biomorphic building, we covered it Monday, evokes a giant eagle coming in for a landing. There's its you know, beak and its head, and these are its wings and its talons. It's, it's a brilliant concept for an airport terminal. So this is for the Olympics, the 1964 Tokyo Olympics. Uh, they just had their Olympics, didn't they? Yeah, somehow a year late, right? <laughs> um, and this was supposed to look like a Japanese warship from medieval times. Remember, I think I've said this, that the word, well, maybe it's only in my R2.1 class. The word medieval has become a universal shorthand for the period of history that used to be only referred to European history, but it isn't anymore. Uh, it just means the period between about 500 and 1500 AD, which is in Europe was originally just called the Middle Ages. So in Japan, in the late Middle Ages, they had a warlord culture, it doesn't mean the whole, but there was a warlord class that ran most of the society, uh, that ran, you know, the powerful groups that ran um, the leadership of the Japanese people. And uh, like, you know, was happening all over the world, of course, certainly in, it was in Europe at that time. They built these big warships, wooden warships, which uh, went well beyond the waters of Japan, you know, at least around the east coast. Uh, the eastern coastline of Asia. So they were a fairly powerful naval uh, culture. And this is meant to be like the prow of one of those ships. This would be like the deck, and that's the stern. And it's working its way through the water. Well, now, why is that appropriate as a motif? Um, there were other people who say, well, the ship's not alive, but you know, it was manned by people and it has that, it, it, it's still considered biomorphic. Others think it looked like a giant sea manatee, but I, I don't see it that way, but that's how some critics look, uh, describe this. It, this was the uh, swim center. This was where the Olympic swimming competitions were held throughout that summer. I remember seeing those Olympics on our little black and white TV. Um, and so all of the swimming events were held inside this one building. And it's a pretty remarkable structure. It's still functioning the way he designed it as a swim center, but I don't think it's being used, was, maybe it was. I can't remember if it was using that last Olympics. I didn't watch those that, that were this summer. But anyway, it's been used uh, in other competing events, but when there's no international competition, it's just used for local, you know, regional, whatever, Japanese uh, com competitions. Um, and so it functions still as well as it did to say it was designed. Now, yeah, I don't know if anyone knows, it's just in Tokyo somewhere outside the center. Of course, obviously you can see there's great, probably just outside the city limits of uh, greater Tokyo. And it still serves its purpose. Kenzo Tange did buildings all over the world, but he started a course in Japan after World War II. And I think he lived until just a few years ago. Highly respected architect. But since I took it off the list, you guys didn't have to take those notes and we won't do a full blown formal analysis, but we will on the remaining slides. Okay, so here we go. Let's see. I'm going to just scroll ahead because I'm trying to remember. Yeah, 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 we've got, we'll, we'll probably finish up all these slides today without having to rush and probably just on time. Uh, okay. <clears throat> so uh, this one is the next must know on the syllabus and actually in order of the way I, they're listed for week 15, okay? Piano and Rogers, funny name, huh? For an architecture firm. <laughs> they weren't a musical duo. Piano and Rogers. I think everyone knows how to spell piano and Rogers is with one G. Okay, the name of this building is Pompidou Center. P O M P I D O U. P O M P I D O U. 
Pompidou Center. Center in French is with a T R E, but uh, we're spelling it the English way, C E N T E R. Of course, you know you guys have your syllabus in front of you uh, throughout the entire exam, of course. 1977. Well, let me ask has anybody here been to France? I thought a couple of people said they had, or yeah. to Paris. Yes? I, I've been to this building. Yeah, okay. When was that? And uh, what did you think of it? <laughs> um probably like five years ago and um the entrance feels if you feel like um a habit trail like for a little um gerbil or something that glass tube that you walk up in it's uh -huh. kind of weird i'm trying to remember i thought there was an escalator part way up but i can't remember maybe it's just steps you could recall because i haven't been to paris in over actually that's uh, um those tubes have escalators in them that's what I remember. That's what I meant. Yes, there was. Okay, I recall correctly. Because because I was there with a preschool teacher from uh, Berkeley, a good friend of mine, uh, who became a godmother to our daughter, in fact, when we had first adopted her. Um, and she was teaching preschool and she spoke fluent French. That's how she got the job. Most Americans would be hired for a job in Paris like that. But it was a dream job for her because she wanted to live in Paris. And I met her on one of my trips and she, she took her class with her up this escalator. Yammering yeah, away in French, I, I never understood most of what she was telling them, but they were all excited about going to this museum. So let's start with what is the building? Well, you could tell us if you care to comment. What the, what was the purpose of the building? In other words, what, what kind of exhibits inside this building? Did I remember it being um, a museum of art and I thought it was yes, modern art. It, absolutely, you got it. So I'll say exactly that. This was is was it's still functioning though i shouldn't say it was but you can say it was designed to be uh a museum of modern art the premier museum of modern art the main one you could say or premier those are two good words to use for institutions uh of all the museums of modern art there's many i mean paris has got hundreds of museums literally hundreds and of course at least two or three dozen world famous museums and this is one of them. But it would be comparable to the MoMA, which, as you may or may not know, first started in New York City way, way back in the 30s. They opened the Museum of Modern Art in New York, and then every other big city has had one, like San Francisco does. If you haven't been there, there's another extra credit option. It's fully open now, you know, uh, I think masks are required. But anyway, the MoMA or Museum of Modern Art concept is, is something that this is, is similar to. It's only art of the 20th century. But what I found interesting, maybe you can tell me, I'm not sure who that was that was saying they, they had been there a few years ago. Uh, when I went there, there was a separate uh, wing of the museum or floor, I guess, or section, you could say section of this museum dedicated to film history. And there aren't as many museums of film history in Europe as there are in this country. But after all, they have their own film industry, of course, and they do respect American films you know, high quality American film. So I got to sit in, with some of my French friends uh, and watch both foreign and American films with subtitles, of course, for the foreign ones. So they have, in other words, all the visual arts are represented in this museum, the, you could say, main or premier museum of modern art in Paris. That's what it was open for, it was built and designed for, and it still functions as that way. Uh, all the time, though, every time I've been here, there have been field trips of school kids, of course, from the greater Paris area. And um, so I don't know when you went there, I guess, right, whether it was during the holidays or something, because it gets really crowded, you know, around Christmas and uh, uh, well, certain times of the year, right? <clears throat> uh, but it's, it's always popular. You see the line of people here. Why don't we go close up here? Yeah, so I'm not sure if this is, you know, to get it, probably to get in, right? <laughs> Did you have to wait very long, by the way? I'm sorry, who was that? that yeah. um, I don't recall having to wait very long. Um, what time of year? Uh, it, it's a lot. It was um, during the summer when I was over there teaching. And, oh, um, you were but it's a lot to take in. I mean, just many, many floors. That's the only thing I remember. You can't ask me anything more. I'm not a, I'm not sure. like you. I don't have that great memory, but I just remember it was just a lot of work. Yes, it is. It's a multifaceted museum. That's why I mentioned the film section. I think it's a whole floor. It's a huge building too. It's really two city blocks long. So here's the facts besides what I just said about the purpose. That always is the first fact you should write in your notes on the meaning of a building. Okay, the next fact 
is that the, this is a very historic district of Paris. I don't know if you can tell from this photo. I have some great slides of it, but they won't convert it into digital format, so I can't show them to you. Um, there is a Gothic church in the distance is Notre Dame, the most famous Gothic church probably in the world. We're gonna, you know, uh, not we're not covering that, that's 2.1, sorry. Uh, but certainly you've seen photos of that. So it's in the middle of the, some people think of it as the oldest neighborhood or district, better word, district in Paris. In other words, it was controversial to build this because they tore down several square, I think it was four, yeah, it was at least, four city blocks, four square blocks of historic buildings to build it. And a lot of people in Paris suppose that. If I'd lived there then, I probably would have. And then when this building, oh, it's all part of the meeting now. When the building opened, once it obviously triumphed over its critics, obviously there it is, it still got a lot of criticism from people in that neighborhood because they thought it was ugly or out of place. It clearly does not blend in with the environment. It's not meant to. This is not um, environmental sense of design, However, it is an early example of two other uh, trends that I didn't require you to write down, but for this slide, you should now do that. This is an early green building. At least that's what I've read. Now, maybe it wasn't designed that way, but now it's functioning that way, where, where the climate is controlled and the energy use is kept at you know, a low level and so forth and so on. It's supposed to be because of the technology available when it was designed. Green design wasn't even yet a term in the 70s, I don't think, but by the 80s or so, I think I remember hearing it that far back. Anyway, certainly in the last 45 years, this building has had some upgrades. But in case it may not have originally been designed as a green building, but it is functions as one now. An energy efficient building is what we're saying. Okay, and then the other thing, even more relevant for the meaning, is this is one of the first buildings of the postmodern school of design. Now that bears definition within the notes for this slide. You won't be asked that on the true false section, right? The definition portion of the final. But you need to write this now for this, the meaning of this uh, site. Uh, so that that term, postmodern, is a movement of late 20th century architecture. Still with us, of course. It began in the late 20s. So, uh, late 20th century. I'm sorry, I'll say it again. It's a movement of 20th century architecture, still in use. Come on, there we go. Um, <clears throat> which reintroduced a variety, and there's only one way to say I'll repeat it. Say it slowly and repeat it once, which reintroduced a variety of colors, textures, materials, and forms. That is totally the antithesis of the Bauhaus school. The only thing they have in, in common is the walls behind those escalators and the unusual framing in front of the windows. That's not Bauhaus. But the walls themselves, if that's all there was, in other words, if all this building had was just this, let's get this over here. You know, if it was just this big cube and nothing else around it, it wouldn't be considered avant-garde or the uh, one of the first or pioneering examples of a new movement called postmodernism, but it was. And that's because, I'll say it again, postmodernism was a movement of late 20th century architecture still in use, come on, which reintroduced a variety of textures, colors, materials, and forms. You know, shapes, of course, but that's how architects describe that. Okay, that's not, quite complete because it also, sorry, last part of the definition of the two sentences of postmodernism is it also has, or these buildings, difficult, these buildings also have a note of whimsy by incorporating historic motifs. These buildings also have a note of whimsy, you know, humor, in other words. Uh, at least the architects think that way a note of whimsy by incorporating historic motifs. This one incorporates, some say the Titanic, some say the Queen Mary, if you've seen some of you, right? Long Beach, that, that ship is one my dad came home from World War II on that ship. 
three weeks on the open deck with 15,000 other GIs coming home from years of fighting in Europe. You never forgot that experience. It's in Long Beach, if you don't know about that one. It's the original massive ocean liner after the Titanic sank. It's the British, was originally. Now it's owned by somebody in the US. So these are 1920s, 30s, you can say early 20th century style ocean liner funnels like you see on the deck of every ocean liner you've seen plenty of movies where they're you know marvel movies or whatever they are where there's battles of fights you know on the deck of a large ocean liner type ship and if nothing else most of you've seen titanic i assume right the 1999 film was it yeah so these these are definitely a throwback to something much much earlier than the building to the 20s when um, the first mega ocean liners, well, actually, even to the early 1900s, just to say it that way, if you want to be specific. Well, where's the historic motif? These are the ventilation shafts. So they obviously connect to the building underneath the plaza. And they are directly inspired by, because most ventilation shafts are just that. All there is grates in the ground. You know, when you walk across the UC Berkeley campus, something like that. And I think some places here on our campus, you know, they're grates with steam coming up and, you know, some other you know things happening down below the ground but here they chose to emphasize them with these art deco is the other way to say it or early 20th century style ocean liner uh you know uh, steam stacks is what they call them in in ocean liners um motifs okay so that's your whimsical thing because it's nothing to do with the building it's just a, a way to refer to a past style that was popular with uh the architects chose that style because they liked it for this whimsical element. So this clearly is one of the first examples of the postmodern style. The variety of forms, if not obvious, and then we'll do a formal analysis. Are some people think this looks like a giant worm, right? Or centipede, even I've heard, but I don't think centipedes ever get this long. It looks like a you know particularly long, or snake. I've heard other people call it like a long snake, winding its way up the side of the building. But that is an escalator and it does allow access to the upper floors if you get off up here, right? Uh, and then you can take elevators up and down, of course. <clears throat> and then this is covered. It rains a lot in Paris all year long, frankly. There's no month where it doesn't rain, maybe August. Um, <clears throat> so being protected from the weather is an important uh, aspect of this building. While you're waiting to go in or after, you, I don't sure if you have it doesn't matter whether you had to buy your ticket first to use that escalator. I don't think so, but it doesn't matter. At least it's an access point, which is reminiscent of a snake. And there's a little bit of humor too, but that's not a historic motif. That's just a, <coughs> oh, some would say biomorphic detail. And then we have the color. Yeah, it's got uh, red. And you, what you can't see here is some of these panels, uh, when they close the building, uh, are yellow. Well, you can see the blue here on some of them. So there's gray, blue, gray, and yellow panels in the windows, some of the windows anyway, and red doorways, right? And here's what, an orange beam? So you can see there, and then the rest is silver and gray. Of course, so there's a variety of colors, obviously. And forms, well, there we go, the forms, I guess I already covered that. Let's see, textures, yeah, we got glass, metal, plastic. This is plastic, <laughs> very thick plastic. And these materials are uh, obviously, you know, a variety of types of materials. And can, of course, they create a variety of textures, obviously, although they're all smooth, they're different materials and different textures. So this is a classic example, early, early pioneering, you could say, example of that movement, postmodernism. If you don't know uh, any buildings that fit that definition, when they finally reopen the cafeteria here on the main campus, I've been hearing they're going to do it next semester, we'll see at least for takeout of uh, that building is a postmodern building. Take a look at the outside of it on the main campus, of course, right next to the library. There are decorative details on that building that are historic motifs. And then the building has a, a blend of modern and, and uh, whimsical touches to it and varieties of colors and textures. So it, it's a postmodern building. The um, food services that they call, it, I don't know what the name of it is, where you used to be able to go get really great <laughs> lunches. And we may soon again. Okay, so there's postmodern architecture all around us. We're going to see another example from Portland, Oregon after this. Okay, let's wrap up this slide with a quick formal analysis. It's completely symmetrical, left to right, totally. 
And if you divide it down the middle, it's six stories. So it, it's it balanced both ways. Of course, the rhythm is in the framing, the window, right? The framing. And then of course the uh, escalators, the covered, I guess you would call them. This this is also escalators, I recall. Yeah, right. So all the escalators have a similar overall round, round tube-like shape. Uh, and of course the uh, exterior girding or framing creates rhythm. It's almost entirely stable except for the one snake-like, we'll call it uh, escalator that goes all the way up the top of the building. That, that's dynamic, but everything else is stable. I already mentioned the textures, smooth, real textures of glass, metal, and plastic. I already mentioned the colors, but warm, you need to be, if it's on the exam specific, where those are, or in this section where these doorways are on each floor, surrounded with a warm red color. And I'm not sure what that is. That's probably some kind of observation post. Uh, and then there's a warm color on this one beam. Most of the colors, the rest of the colors are cool, you know, cool. Well, you don't see the yellow in this one, but I've seen it where the windows have the, I think that's when they close it. Somehow the panels that, you know, cover the windows, or some of them are yellow. But in this photo, all you can see is the cool uh, silver, gray, and blue colors on the window. Uh oh Ah, <laughs> yeah, I've got it. There we go. <laughs> That's good. Won't let that happen. That did happen once, <laughs> one day. Okay, just tighten the connection. There we go. So we, all right. All right, let's finish up. Uh, this is um, really a single mass. I don't think you could break it down into other masses for space. It's a six story tall building with various sized exhibit rooms on each floor. That's pretty much all you, all you have to say, but this is all real space. I don't remember how tall, it, how high it is, but it, it's, it's certainly about 80 feet. You could say that it's around 80 feet tall for the total height. Uh, the line is visual line, right? Around the framing the doors and the windows uh, and in, in the um, plastic tubing, I guess you can call that, of each escalator. Um, and now let's see. Um, Balance, I already said that. I think I covered everything. Color, oh, modeling. There's there's not really any modeling. It's just shadows from the sun. And Paris is overcast so much that you often don't have like this day, hardly any shadows at all. Okay, let's see. Am I forgetting anything? I don't think so. Sometimes I have to stop and count how many of the nine elements and I forget one. Okay. Nope. All right, let's go on to a really interesting structure here. This is the uh, Portland Services Building, just like it sounds. I think you all know how to spell that. City, right? In Oregon, Portland Services Building by Graves. His name belied his demeanor, as they say. It was the opposite of what kind of a person he was. He wasn't a grave person. G-R-A-V-E-S. 1982. This is Portland City Hall. That's just another name for this. It's Portland City Hall, but it really is. So it was designed as the center of the Portland municipal government. The mayor's office is in here. And this is as postmodern as you can get. It's one of the first postmodern buildings in America. That's an important detail of our fact, I mean, about the meaning. And so what we see here is those features, I've already mentioned them, but they apply to this slide very clearly, even more obviously than that uh, Pompidou Center, is the variety of textures, colors, forms, and materials. But let's start with the last aspect, the whimsical aspect of what makes a building part of the um, postmodern style. Okay, I'm gonna do a close up. Can anybody think of an ancient culture? I know we haven't covered ancient cultures in this class, but many of you take an ancient art history or just have an interest in it that might have had, remember this says the mayor's office. <laughs> okay, he's the head person, supposedly, right? Top of the heap, the ruler in Portland of these city affairs. What other culture could in the ancient world could have had this kind of a shape of some kind of attire? And I'll give you a clue on top of their heads. Anybody think of anything? That, uh, it's not the best angle to get this point across, but- uh, Yeah, Egyptian. Yes, excellent, excellent. Very, very astute, yep. 
it's supposed to look like a pharaoh's headdress. And of course, that is, is a cliche at this point. I mean, ever since Steve Martin did his uh, King Tut song, which of course wouldn't be politically correct now, but it was popular when King Tut's exhibits were traveling around the US back when they used to let his mummy and his coffin and his face mask go out of Egypt. They will never do that again. Um, I think one or two of you said you saw it in the early 80s, yeah. This building was designed around that time. So it's, in other words, it, the whimsy here is that the mayor's like the pharaoh. <laughs> He's supposed, but of course they're not. The real mayor doesn't just dictate everything. I mean, this at least not supposed to be in most cities. There's some kind of a de democratic process, right? And elections and of course opposition to people. And that's, you know, it's a whimsical comment on when you go to city hall, there's a phrase, you can't fight city hall. There's some truth to that. It's often very hard to get officials, any official, who has any power in the city government to change their mind or to, to, to uh, alter their rules. It is difficult, but it is possible. In any case, he's just being whimsical. The architect is saying, so you enter this building, you're, if you're gonna go see the mayor or anyone on his staff, you're going to visit the local favor. So that's their whimsical touch or his whimsical touch. And of course it's historic, ancient history. Yeah, so that's supposed to look the whole upper part like a pharaoh's headdress. And it's obvious there are varieties of colors, we we'll do the form elements, textures, materials, and forms or shapes on the outside of the building. Has anybody been inside this building? Uh, Portland, what well, used to be one of my favorite cities. I don't think it's safe to go there anymore, frankly. I have family up there, my wife's family, and they don't go into downtown Portland much anymore. It's kind of sad, uh, but that may, that's home it's temporary the crazies have taken over yeah <clears throat> um but anyway what we have here is a building no one here has been inside because it's if you go inside you'll never forget it it's not your typical city hall it, outside or inside okay it has an open atrium in the middle with a light court which means that it's i think it's about up to the eighth floor there's a glass dome well, it's probably flat i can't remember if it's curved or not in which the light comes flooding down and there are redwood trees and waterfalls several stories tall in the lobby. I think it might be one waterfall, but there's several redwood trees, which of course are local, right? Plant life imported and planted inside this building. And I'm not sure if they transported full grown redwoods or just let them grow. But the last time I was in this building in the uh, mid aughts or somewhere in that, it was already over 20 years old. And these, these were like 50, 60 foot tall redwood trees easily in the lobby of City Hall. I don't know another city that could claim that. And of course, that's a, a nod to their environment. They're, you know, obviously very beautiful, natural environment in parts of Oregon, especially around Portland, Northern Oregon. So, so this building in that sense has not just the postmodern features that you see in this slide of the mixtures of you know variety I mean of uh, textures right and materials colors and forms and the whimsical element of the Egyptian pharaoh's headdress it also has a nod or you could say a reference inside to the local environment but it you can call this environmentally uh, uh, integrated but you can say it is a green building oh this one is built from day one to be energy efficient by the time this was built in the 80s, that, that was already a factor for some, not many, but for some public buildings. Some of them in Washington, D.C. were were starting to do that already by this time. The architect Graves, he just died a few years ago, uh, designed mostly residential structures, including high-rise you know, condo units and multi-unit buildings. But he also did several public buildings in just this all over all around the United States. He didn't do so much, I don't think, outside the US, but he was a very successful architect. And he believed that postmodern style was an important counterpoint. You could say he was interviewed many times uh, on PBS. I know when this building opened a great sensation, because nothing like no other city hall was anything like it anywhere in the US. He was asked why did he choose this postmodern concept? He said, because you know, the less is more philosophy. We've been there, done that. It's dull. It's boring. So he wanted to reintroduce these uh, varieties of elements, which is what this style is all about. So he's the first, just say major, well, this building, say it again, is the first major example in the United States 
a postmodern arc uh, public building in the postmodern style, the first major one that helped set a trend. So it is also a seminal work of art. Remember that concept it applies to all visual arts, a work of art that changes the course of that medium of art from that point forward. So this postmodern style, I just mentioned, you have a couple buildings here on our own campus, the main campus at Santa Rosa JC and many other colleges, as well as public buildings around the, and commercial buildings, of course. So it's for any large public building, this, this is a common uh, motif that's, or style, I meant to say, uh, that's being used still to this day and um, will probably continue to be. It's a reaction against the Bauhaus. It, it, that's really, I should have probably just said it that, well, here we go. Here's Bauhaus for you, right up the street. I can see why in my mind, the city fathers hired Stern to build this because he was already known to do some early postmodern buildings, smaller ones than this one. And they weren't as well known, but somehow they found out about that and they wanted him to do a postmodern building. Obviously, they wanted to hire him. They didn't want Lunkhead, is what my friend Alan Temko, if you remember, we started this lecture, was my thesis advisor and won the Pulitzer Prize in architectural criticism and ran the architectural history program at Cal State East Bay. Um, he called this kind of architecture Lunk head architecture. I personally agree. I mean, here we go. Here's some more of it. You know, whatever you think of this style, it definitely is not boring. And that's what the uh, purpose of the intention of this style and the architect's reason for choosing it. Okay, let's do a form analysis. We're going to actually still have a couple more slides to finish up from the syllabus uh, on Monday, but then I'll go ahead and tell you that we're going to uh, see some, I think you'll agree, it's, well, I'd like to call it a visual treat, the interiors and, and, and close-up views and details of uh, buildings that some of which you could still use as extra credit that are either by Bernard Maybeck or Julia Morgan, speaking of First Bay Tradition, they were the founders, two of the founders of that movement. Uh, and you won't need to take notes when we get to those slides, but you will at the start of the Monday lecture because we didn't quite finish. There's a lot to say about the pyramids of the Louvre, and that is a slide I won't cut from the study list. But we'll do that because we're almost out of time on Monday. And then segue into my um, professional photographers. They're not my slides. Uh, one of the best I ever worked with that took the photos for all three of my architecture books. His photos of uh, details, interiors, exteriors of really fascinating buildings that are mostly in Northern California or even in the Bay Area that you could go and take photos of yourself if you choose. The architecture option for extra credit. Okay, so that's what we'll do on Monday. Uh, and well, that'll go on into Wednesday. And I think next Wednesday, I'll index to early then. And then the week after that, we're reviewing for the final. Okay, so this is symmetrical. Yes, it is, no question. Even though at first glance, you might think, how, how so? But yeah, it's equal spaces and, and, and details on either side. And it's true on the side here. See, these are that's another motif, which I'm not sure of the reference here. They look like ribbons, you know, first place ribbons from a county fair. Right? That motif, I'm not quite sure what that is, but we know what this one is. Okay, then the colors, obviously warm on the upper part of the building where the Pharaoh's headdress is. And this is, of course, a warm red color, painted concrete, by the way, as it is on the side. And then warm, light yellow, colors a stone on the walls of the building. And then down here, it's cool. This is all uh, aquamarine, you know, bluish green uh, marble on the, the first three floors. And then that, of course, is what the textures are. So I'll, I'll label them each, you know, as you go, it should be right. This. There's all real textures here, real smooth marble on the ground floors, real smooth stone on the upper floors, real smooth glass and steel on the windows and real smooth polished concrete on the uh, decorative details. Now this actually I think is tile if I recall. No, no, it's concrete, it's concrete. Uh, and that's a purple color. So you decide is that actually it's more of a, of a, of a light brown and this picture is a slightly off color because of the cool weather, whoever took it, um, <clears throat> not my photo. So if it looks cool to you and it's on the exam, I give you credit, but it actually, it's a warm light brown kind of liver color actually. Okay, then we have the rhythm, of course, powerful rhythm of the uh, ziggurat-like, right? Step pyramid, and it is that. 
OTC. There's another historic reference here. Step or setback pyramids, which the Babylonians used and some Egyptian pyramids too. Uh, that creates rhythm, the setbacks, the windows, of course, and the concrete uh, pilasters, it's called pilasters. And the, the motif of the pharaoh headdress, that all creates rhythm, of course. It is mostly stable except for the top two features, which are the projecting balconies. These are actually balconies. And the decorative feature of the Pharaoh's headdress. Those are you know, diagonal lines. So that part of the building is dynamic. Everything else is stable. For space, you have a building that is, I think it's 15 stories. I'm pretty sure I have that right. About 15 stories, if it's close enough. Uh, with a, a very tall open lobby. You can say atrium if you prefer, because that's another way of saying a, a, a room or lobby with a glass skylight above it. That is several stories. I can't remember if it's five or six, several stories tall in the center. And then various um, sizes of offices arranged around each floor, around the outer part of the building. I don't know the height of it. Uh, I think I'll you know, need to write that. <clears throat> but it is about 15 stories. That's, that's close enough. It's balanced, totally symmetrical, yeah. And then um, let's see, there's no technique for modeling. It's just whenever the shadows create, uh, sun, I mean, sorry, <laughs> create shadows. And the lines here are all visual around the edge of the headdress motif, the pilasters, uh, and the corners of the building. And of course, that's when the sun, a typical overcast part of the day, it isn't very full of shadows in this photo, but when there are, you'll see even stronger lines. Let's see, I think I've covered everything. Uh, rhythm, um, there's no larger or small mass. Yeah, I, I don't know. You could break it down, I suppose, into the upper floors is one mass and the entry, you know, setbacks are a second mass. If you did, that would be obviously two different masses, the largest of which would be the upper floors, and the smaller of the two would be the first few floors, the entry portion. Okay, well, here we are, right at 415. So I'm going to go ahead and stop share and stick around for a few minutes if there are any questions anybody has about anything we just covered, about extra credit. If you joined late, I think one maybe or two people did. Um, I still have some papers that I just got at around midnight last night from one of my readers, so I haven't had a chance to enter those, but I will probably Friday before evening, you know, before dinner time on Friday. I should be able to send those grades to everybody. I'll make that commitment now because that's easy enough to do. So if you turned your paper in on time, your second paper, and you didn't get a grade, don't panic. Unless you want me to double confirm I got it, I do whatever I'm asked by a student in an email to do that. But uh, I'm pretty sure I didn't miss any. But if you want to double check, send me an email. And uh, I'm not going to respond to emails on Thanksgiving. OK, but Friday. You'll see your grade. That'll be how you know it was received. Um, but then if after you know, by Saturday morning, you haven't received a grade, that would mean that it might be a good time for you to email me and say, somehow I didn't get my grade or did you get my paper? And it's easy to fix that. All of you have a record of what you did and didn't send, of course, or when you sent things if they were on time. So all the papers turned in on time that I received have been graded. that will be entered in my roll book and um, I will give you the grades for those who didn't already get them. I've sent many people their grade. So far, I was doing a good job on the papers, on the second paper, so my compliments. Okay, any questions now from anybody about grades, extra credit, or uh, this, this topic? We up the modern architecture. Anybody? Now is your chance. Okay, I always give you guys another few seconds just to think if there is something on the you know, that's you can always email me, of course, but don't expect a response until sometime Friday afternoon if you email me in the meantime. But I hope you're just going to forget about work and study and everything relating to grades for at least the next whatever. If you have a class tonight, like I do, to teach at least from tonight until Friday. So hopefully you all have a great Thanksgiving. Okay, relax, enjoy it. Thank you. And uh, thank Happy you. Thanksgiving, Mark. Happy Thanksgiving. Happy Thanksgiving to you guys too. Okay, I'll see you guys on Monday. Bye bye. Bye.